welcome everybody this evening we have webinar number five of the year um which is part of our free webinar series as part of the general dental residency my name is Emmanuel and I'm excited tonight to be joined by my close friend and superstar orthodontist, Dr. Ben Pillar. So Ben studied um, his dental degree at University of Sydney and he did his master's in orthodontics at Tel Aviv University in Israel. He currently practices orthodontics in his Blue Mountain clinic as well as Bondi Junction where he actually recently straightened my teeth and helped me look less like a chipmunk, which Ben, thank you for that. Um, sure. Ben's actually doing some very cool stuff that is, is Bondi Junction practice now where he has two separate clinics right next to each other, a adult only clinic and a, a children's one. So the, the adult only one is, is very schmick. Um, it's got the, the fireplace, the alcoholic drinks menu, basically everything you could want and more. Um, and yeah, he's been kind enough to talk to us about his specialty and what us as general dentists should know about orthodontics, whether it's a service that you provide or that you refer out to. So without further ado, I, I want to introduce Ben Pillar. Good evening, everybody. And uh, Emmanuel, thank you for the kind introductions. Very, uh, very nice words. I appreciate it. My uh, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for um, coming to the lecture tonight. I thought it would be important to discuss uh, orthodontics uh, in totality because if, uh, if it was anything like when I graduated dental school, I didn't really know much about orthodontics. It wasn't covered very broadly. I didn't feel very equipped. And when I went into dental practice, I didn't really know much about it. So I prepared this lecture to really cover the basics. So for those who have a bit of an understanding about orthodontics, there'll be some revision. And for everybody else, we'll take you from the beginning all the way through. Um, so like Emmanuel said, without further ado, we'll get started uh, on understanding orthodontics, definitions, indications, and treatment. So yeah, like Emmanuel said, I own and operate three practices in Sydney, two in Bondi Junction. This is the first one, Eastern Suburbs Orthodontics, which focuses mainly on kids and the practice next door, which is called the Smile Suite, which is now just targeted to adults. Uh, and my practice in the mountains, uh, which has been there for many, many years, is called Mountains Orthodontics and uh, has a very busy practice. And I work there throughout the week as well. So I split my time between the three practices. Um, here are the topics that we're going to cover this evening, six, uh, six areas, uh, definitions and terminology, indications for early treatment, growth modification and interceptive orthodontics, ortho systems, orthognathic surgery, and then stability and retention. So let's get started with some definitions and terminology, hey? Um, skeletal pattern. So we have three skeletal patterns, orthognathic, retronathic, prognathic. You may have heard these terms before. Orthognathic is when the maxilla and the mandible are aligned, and that is your general average person or case. Retronathic, where the lower jaw is set back, and prognathic, where the lower jaw is advanced, as you can see in examples B and C here. Along with your skeletal, skeletal pattern, you also have a soft tissue profile, which is attached. Normally, the convex profile, when the lower jaw is retronathic, the orthognathic facial type has a straight profile and concave for your prognathic mandibles. Now, some very clever orthodontists out of um, Brazil um, doctored this photo to display the differences in facial types. So it's the same person. And you can see here the three different facial types that we, we deal with on a daily basis. Brachyfacial, which is your more square face. Mesiofacial, your average kind of face. And then dolicofacial, which is your more vertical longer face. So these are our three facial types. And if we go underneath and look at the skeletal structure that's associated, a brachyfacial template is a very square jaw where the mandible and the maxilla are almost parallel to each other. Mesiofacial, where the mandible has a little bit of an angle, which is your more normal um, facial type or your average facial type. And dolicofacial, where you have more vertical mandibular pattern. And that gives you your longer vertical or dolicofacial pattern facial type as we as we 
call it. Now, once you break down the face, we have to go inside and we have to look at the teeth. Um, we have obviously class one, class two, and class three dental relationships. Class one is your normal relationship where the mesiobuccal cusp of the upper first molar sits in the mesiobuccal groove of the lower first molar. That's our first picture in the top right. I'm sorry, guys, I don't have any access to my mouse or pointers, so I just have to describe where to look. Class two, which is the most common malocclusion that we'll see, is where the lower molar is set back from the upper molar. And class three is the reverse, where the lower molar and the lower jaw is set forward compared to the upper first molar. So moving on from classifications, we've got overbite and overjet, which we'll get to in a moment. But the overbite, like it says here on the slide, is the vertical overlap of the incisors. And it's normally one to two millimeters. Anything greater than this is classified as a deep bite. Anything less than this is classified as a shallow or even an open bite, which some of you may or may not have seen. The purpose of the open of the overbite is to permit the anterior teeth to function or, or eat while the posterior teeth are out of occlusion. So that's very important uh, because when we're biting on our front teeth, we don't want our back teeth touching. An example, here's a patient, now that we've discussed some classifications, you can see here she's mandibular retronathic, she's got a convex profile, uh, she's got a very deep bite. You don't see any of the low incisors, 100% overbite. Uh, and she's got a class two relationship as well. So this is her initial, and then this is her final. Uh, after orthodontic treatment, she was an extraction case, deep bite correction. You can see an improvement in the profile as well, and obviously in the deep bite. Now, the opposite of that is the open bite. The patient who comes in where the front teeth don't touch. Uh, so this is the initial, and then the final uh, non-extraction case. You can see obviously the teeth, teeth now occlude and um, she has much better occlusion and, and function. And she was also supposed to be a surgical case, which we managed to treat non-surgically, which the patient was mother were very happy about. Overjet, the other one to know about. This is the horizontal overlap of the incisors and it's normally the width of the incisors, so two to three millimeters. Um, the purpose of the overjet is to allow the, anti the posterior teeth to function while the anterior teeth are out of, out of occlusion. So when you're biting on your back teeth, your front teeth won't touch. That's the purpose of the overjet. And the reverse is true. The overbite, when your front teeth are touching, your back teeth, your posterior teeth don't touch. Um, with the overjet, uh, when the incisors are upper incisors are behind the lower incisors, we call this a reverse overjet or an anterior crossbite. One way to remember the differences between overjet and overbite, overjet, um, the word jet is like a plane which always moves forward and overjet is related to the horizontal distance between the top and bottom teeth. So it's a nice way to think of overjet versus the overbite, which is the vertical component. Here's a patient with a very severe class three malocclusion with a reverse overjet, deep bite. You don't see any of the upper teeth, very severe. Uh, and we managed to treat this patient and correct the overjet, the reverse overjet uh, and straighten the teeth. And you can see there we've improved his facial profile. He now has a straight profile. From here, you can see very prognathic to start and a concave profile. And we're able to convert him to a nice straight class one profile. Unfortunately, this patient wasn't so good with his oral hygiene. And if you have a look closely at the lateral incisors and canines, you can see some decalcification, which is an unfortunate side effect of orthodontics. And it does occur where patients' hygiene drops. And as such, we get you know, leaching of the minerals from the enamel surface, which needs to be dealt with after orthodontic treatment. So that's something to be mindful of. Great, COCR discrepancy. This is when they're the centric relation and the centric occlusion do not coincide and is usually associated with a shift. So there's three kinds of shifts, dental, functional, and skeletal. The dental one is when you've got a tooth that's in the wrong place. Functional, more importantly, is when there's a premature contact and usually you have a, a shift of the jaw and that's often because, because of a crossbite. 
And then a skeletal shift is when the jaw has grown um, asymmetrically to one side or another. So if we have a look at a patient, here's a young girl, she's got a crossbite of the one, two, and as such, she's got a functional shift and the lower, the upper and lower midlines do not match. And we can see an offset in her bite uh, on the lateral photographs. So once she's treated with braces and things are straightened up, you can see the midlines return to normal and the occlusion, the buccal occlusion has significantly improved. Functional shifts are really important to create, to create, to correct at a young age, because if they're left untreated, they can become skeletal shifts, which can only be corrected with orthognathic jaw surgery. So very important to catch a shift early if you see a crossbite and have it addressed. Leeway space. This is a term I wasn't familiar with either. Um, some of you may or may not know it, but essentially it talks about how the primary first and second molars that are eventually replaced by the permanent first and second premolars are actually bigger. The, the deciduous teeth are bigger than the adult premolars that are going to come after them, which means that we get extra arch length in the lower jaw, um, two and a half millimeters per side and one and a half millimeters per side in the upper arch, which can be very useful when you've got a crowded patient. And we'll get into this a little bit more later, but that's the leeway space. So there are five ways to resolve crowding. And these are the five here. You can either procline the teeth, which means driving the teeth forwards. You can expand, which means widening the arch. You can distalize, which means moving the teeth backwards. You can do interproximal reduction, which means polishing between the teeth individually, or you can extract. So Emmanuel, are you still there? I can't hear you. Um, so I was going to ask Emmanuel how he thought we would resolve this case. Sorry, I, um, I am still here. I, I, are you there? I, I muted myself. <laughs> oh, okay, good. So Emmanuel, <laughs> have a look at this case. How do how, out of the five options, what did I do here? What do you think? Um, <laughs> I mean, to me, it looks like an extraction case, but it, it's obviously also a very narrow case. I, I don't know how much. You're right. You You're right. Yeah. 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 Super crowded. You can see here, super crowded case. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't, extraction should always be the last option, which is why I leave it at number five on the list, but you're right. Sometimes you do have to extract. And in this case, in this case we did and, um, got a favorable outcome for the patient. Yeah, I just right, want to say, Ben, you you told me you wouldn't ask me any clinical questions on the live. <laughs> <So, laughs> I appreciate well, that. I've got, <laughs> I've got to involve some people along the way. You're the only okay, person I can talk perfect. to. <laughs> All right, let's continue. So now that we've done definitions, let's look at indications for treatment. Um, Amanda, also, if anybody raises questions along the way and you want me to stop and review a slide, just let me know, or we can always backtrack at the end. Will do. Okay. In in the great indications for early treatment. So this is your, your basic list of, of early treatment indications. So class two, class three malocclusions, transverse problems, which is width issues, asymmetries and shifts we've covered, open bites and deep bites, uh, ectopic canines, we'll get onto that, moderate to severe crowding, large or reverse overjet habits, and obviously patients that have self-esteem issues. The benefits, well, they're gonna include, obviously improvements to the patient's self-esteem, greater ability to modify the growth process, earlier resolution um, of, the, de of de the developing malocclusion, greater patient compliance. Younger patients often are more compliant than the older ones. More stable results, shorter treatment time in the permanent dentition, and less potential for atrogenic damage, such as fracture, root resorption, decalcification, which I've shown you, and perio problems. So ectopic canines. Unfortunately, we see a lot of these and you are gonna see a lot of them too. The canine is the, the last tooth to come into the mouth. So therefore it is always fighting for space. And it is often the one that gets impacted and we have struggle, we have problems getting it in. And more often than not, it's the maxilla more than the mandible. And um, the rule of thumb goes that if you don't see the canine there by the age of 10, best or you have a or have a canine bulge, 
best to take a panoramic or a PA and just see how things are going. When the canine gets on the move, that's when things start to become difficult. So if the canine is less than half of the lateral incisor's root was passed or overlapping of less than half of the root of a lateral incisor, more, more often than not, we'll be able to manage it. When it passes that point, that's when things start to get a bit difficult. Uh, we've looked at extracting of deciduous canines. You have to be very careful with this because extracting deciduous canine will only resolve 64% of impacted canines. That's two out of three. Um, I don't really like those odds, two out of three, because if you take a canine out, a baby canine, and we lose the space, the canine, the adult canine doesn't come down and we lose the space, we're potentially looking at extractions. And that's never a nice conversation to have with a parent. So I would rather leave the canine in uh, and save the space than extract the canine and, and have to extract a permanent tooth following. So let's have a look at how we deal with impacted canines. This is a video from the, the software I use at work called Dolphin. And basically we have to send the patient to a periodontist. They do a canine exposure where they remove a little bit of their gingival tissue in the bone. I attach an eyelet and then I slowly bring the tooth into the arch. And when I say slowly, this that process, which we've seen in about 10 seconds, normally takes about a year just to get down and into the mouth. So I've got a, I believe I've got a case. Oh, it's coming up. We'll see. We'll have a look at a case in, in just a moment. Um, large overjet. So this is another issue that we have with young patients, especially in, in relation to trauma. Because, you know, kids with very protruded teeth, active kids will often fall over, pool accidents, scooter accidents, playground accidents, it all happens. So if the overjet is severe and we treat them early, often we can reduce the, uh, the risk of trauma. And that's what was found in this study here. And this is another patient who had overjet and who we treated. And you can see the before and after in the top left corner, the reduction in overjet. And in the bottom right corner, you can see an improvement that you get in the facial profile as well. So we're going from a convex to a straight profile, which is obviously more aesthetic and more functional. So moderate to severe crowding, another indication for early treatment. As we saw previously in the leeway space slide, we can gain five millimeters of space on either side of the arch in the mandible and a significant amount in the upper as well. So often in, in, in kids, they'll lose the primary canines, the deciduous canines prematurely, they get knocked out, they fall out, and then we lose all the space for the permanent canine. So the photo on the left shows a child who lost, let's say two thirds of the space for the permanent canine. But because we saw them prior to eruptions of the permanent um, first and second premolars, we were able to use this appliance, which is called a lingual arch. And what it does is it prevents the molars from drifting forward, which saves the leeway space and allows the canines to erupt and everything to migrate distally. So this obviously, this appliance saves us from having to extract a lot of teeth when placed prior to losing the primary first and second molars. Habits, obviously there are a lot of kids that will suck their thumbs and this leads to proclination of the upper incisors and also needs to narrowing of the upper jaw and can also cause open bites. Uh, the sooner that we reverse these habits, the better. Prior to the age of five or six, we'll see these symptoms resolve on their own anything after that and the, the changes will likely be, be permanent. So here's a little video of what actually happens with a, in a thumb sucker. We can see changes in the anterior maxilla to the incisors, change in the art form from a round oval shape to a triangular shape. This is another appliance that you can use to, to prevent it. But essentially we have to try and break the habit. Um, Supernumerary teeth, uh, another big indication for early treatment. They obviously disrupt the normal eruption of teeth and um, the whole aim here is to extract the supernumeraries and obviously they, they occur most commonly in the anterior maxilla. So Emmanuel, I've got another question for you. Come back online. I, I'm here. <laughs> All right, so this is one of my patients. 
Mm -hmm. And you can see here that we haven't impacted one three and we've got some supernumeraries. So I'd like you to take a guess of how many supernumeraries we had here. How many do you think you see? I, just I around the canine, it. just around the canine. That's it. They're just around the yeah. canine. Are there two right there? The crown. Okay, so are good there guess. Two facing each other. Let's take a look at the surgery. So this was the surgery. You can see the size of the hole. Yes. Would you like to refine your guess? <laughs> I'm guessing there were more than two. <laughs> Correct. There were, in fact, were ten. Oh my super god. Numerous. Ten. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, you would never guess that from the from the OPG. Uh, and a year later, we were able to get the canine down and into place, and then continue on with the rest of the treatment, which would be closing the spaces. But pretty remarkable, isn't it? Yeah, I, I'm happy I wasn't doing that. I mean, not that I do this surgery, but <laughs> I wouldn't have wanted to to do yeah. it. Yeah, friendly periodontist helped me out with that one. Great. So that's uh, supernumeraries. Let's have a look at ankylosed teeth. So some of you may or may not be familiar with ankylosed teeth. It's when the mainly the primary teeth are fused to the to the alveolar bone and they're unable to exfoliate when the permanent tooth is erupting. Now, this fusion can be at one spot or it can be all the way around the root. But either way, the baby tooth will not fall out. A really good tip to finding these teeth is to take your mirror, the back of your mirror, and just gently tap on the teeth. When you tap on an ankylosed tooth, it will make a hollow sound. It sounds completely different from when you tap on any other tooth. So you'll be tapping on the teeth, they'll all make a regular pitch sound. You tap on an ankylosed tooth, and it'll, it'll sound like a bing. Like it, it sounds really different. And so you'll know that that is. And when you have ankylosed teeth, unfortunately, the adult teeth can't come up underneath them, and the transeptal fibers around the teeth start to pull the adjacent teeth into that area. Um, there's one good point here about a permanent tooth should replace its primary predecessor when it's approximately three quarters of the root length. Uh, and you can see that over here in this x-ray, we've got an ankylosed uh, 6-5 with an impacted 2-5, which is due to erupt, but because the baby tooth is ankylosed, it can't. Now we have to be careful with these because if we leave them for too long, the tooth will, all the teeth continue to grow and we see less and less and less of the ankylosed tooth, making it even harder for the surgeon to remove it. So ankylosed teeth, something to, to keep an eye out for. All right, let's move on to section three, growth modification and interceptive orthodontics. So growth is important. Uh, obviously, whenever there's a discrepancy between the two jaws, the ideal way to deal with it is with facial growth. And the way that we do that is by addressing one or two of the jaws. And this treatment can be very successful if it's done at the right time. But the idea is to do it at the right, is to catch the right time. And when is the right time? Generally, I like to see kids around the age of nine if they're more developed and more precocious, especially with the girls, maybe a little bit younger, and sometimes with the boys a little bit later. But as a rule of thumb, eight or nine is a good stage to look at. And if they don't need treatment, well, we can plan it for the future. So let's look at timing of treatment and the different draw structure. So the clearest indication for treatment for skeletal problems prior to adolescence is for the maxilla. And the reason for this is that the maxilla fuses to the skull base around the age of 10. So the mandible, the lower jaw, is a hinge joint and is free, but the maxilla actually fuses to the skull at age 10. So if we want to advance the mandible, we have to do that before adolescence. Uh, patients with excessive maxillary growth and deficiency in, deficiency in the mandible, mandible, we want to address when they're in adolescence, right? So when they are growing, that's when we're going to deal with our retronathic jaws. And on the flip side of that, patients that have an excessive or strong lower jaw, we really want to deal with those ones later because lower jaw growth for strong lower jaws is unpredictable. And it continues well into the 20s and early 30s, which is why MaxFax won't do surgery on kids 
until they're into early adulthood or into their 20s. So strong lower jaws, we delay. Setback lower jaws, we get at adolescence. And maxillary issues, we want to see prior to adolescence, which is around the age of 10. So I just popped out of my presentation for a moment. So for skeletal class two problems, the setback lower jaw, the best way to deal with this is during the growth phase with a functional appliance. Now there is a array of functional appliances. You may have heard of twin blocks. This is the binator. It is a combination. It's the, the upper and the lower plate in one, which is why I like it. And it's fit, uh, as you can see here for the patient, it fits into the upper jaw and the lower jaw connects into it. I think I have a little video here where it's coming up to show you about it. But research, there's been extensive research about bionators and functional appliances, and they've shown that there's definitely a growth that occurs in the lower jaw when used correctly and timed correctly. And there's also an increase in the nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal airway space. And this is really important, excuse me, because it helps with the airways. Uh, patients, younger patients, particularly that have sleep apnea, um, have setback lower jaws, which means the, the tongue is set back as well, which blocks the, the airways. And studies have shown that the AHI, which is the um, index for sleep apnea index, reduces significantly with functional appliances, and so does the oxygen saturation. So there's a lot of benefits to these appliances, uh, not just malocclusions, but also airways. So this is what the bionator looks like. It's one piece. It goes into the mouth like this. It clicks in. The lower jaw is held forward in a forwards position. As you hold the lower jaw forwards, that stimulates the jaw to grow from the back to the front because that's how the mandible actually grows from the condyle to the anterior maxilla. And it's in there for 18 to 24 months. I mean, it can be 12 to 18 months, but in most, case, most cases, 18 to 24 months is how long you need the plate. And in my patients, I, I only... Uh, have them wear the plate at home time at night time when they go to sleep because that's when they're going to do most of their growing yeah when they're asleep so let's look at a case um this is a 10 year old boy he's got a class 2 malocclusion in the mixed dentition mandibular ret retronathic with a convex profile and a brachyfacial template and he was only treated with a bionator now that we've been through some of these terms i'm going to start to use them in our classifications um, so you get a bit more familiar with them. So here's the young boy, setback lower jaw. You can see his mandibular retronathic. You can see he has a convex profile. He also has a deep bite. And in the top right corner, you can see he has a significant overjet of about six to eight millimeters. After treatment, we can see a significant improvement in the lower jaw and the profile. He's even had some deep bite correction and a significant reduction in the overjet in the top right corner, which has gone down to about two to three millimeters. So this was his appliance that was used, uh, the bionator, and it used only at home time and night time, like I mentioned. And this is his initial and his final, and his initial and his final. Now the family didn't want to have braces. He still had some maxillary space. You can see that his overjet is probably in the two to three millimeter range, and it could be less, but the family didn't want to have any, they were happy with that. They didn't want to do any braces to close up the remaining space. So I was happy with that too. So we called it a day. Maxillary expansion. So I'm sure some of you have heard about expander plates, mainly for patients that have a very narrow upper arch and an associated crossbite. And we resolved these because the mid palatal suture does not fuse in kids, usually until they're around the age of 16, which means that we have quite a long time to expand the upper jaw and um, have some wonderful results with it as well. So it's a fixed appliance. There are removable ones, I should say, which I don't use because the expansion is so quick that if you have a removable plate, it can contract and also you have less control with a removable appliance. So in this case, I only use fixed uh, house appliances. They're normally in there for about 12 months. And you do need the maxillary four incisors in place with root development so that you don't risk damaging the maxillary incisors. So the best age is around eight to nine years. And as you can see here, initial, the middle photo is when the plate was placed and then the final photo after expansion, we can see good width there. The other benefit of expansion is that you actually increase the airway space as well. 
So widen it because it's what sits directly above the palate is the nose. So when you widen the palate, you also increase the nasal cavity volume and you reduce nasal resistance, which um, improves airways, airway breathing, reduces snoring, and improves the position for the tongue as well, which prevents tongue thrusting, which is very good as well. So here's a video about the maxillary expander. It has a little screw in the middle with the right and left side. It gets glued in. And then there's a key and the parents will normally do one turn a day for anywhere up to 16 to 24 days. Wait, come back and see us, we'll check. We need to do some more turns. We can always do some more turns and then braces at the end if they need to finish up the treatment. But there's normally a break between the plate and the braces treatment. So let's look at another case. This is a girl, 12 years of age. Again, class two subdivision, which means she was class two on one side and class one on the other side. Uh, maxillary hypoplastic, which means deficient. And also she had a good straight profile. So the mandible was in a good position, orthognathic. And we treated her with expansion only. So here's the young lady. We can see here she's orthognathic. So she's got a straight profile. Upper and lower jaws are well aligned. However, when we look at the middle photo or the second photo from the left in the bottom row, we can see she's got a crossfire on the left-hand side, almost the entire length, and her lower midline has shifted over to the left because of it. So this is the initial, and then this is the final. Once we've corrected that shift, the midline is, has recorrected because really the jaw has just been held by that crossbite and by the shift. Jaw came back together, and uh, we had some good alignment there. So this is the initial with her plate in, that post expansion, the frontal initial, and then the correction with the cross by correction at the final. I'll just go back to that, sorry, for one minute. And you can just to look up close, you can see here the bottom left picture, how you got the cross on the left, but you've also got this midline offset. And then on the right hand side, once we're corrected, the cross have that midline will correct. And that is the definition of a, of a functional shift. Uh, if you can correct the midline like that, your shift is not skeletal, it's not fixed. And if we treat these long enough, we can usually get the mandible back to the right place, which saves a kid from having surgery down the track, which is quite um, unfortunate if we have to go down that path. Okay, uh, class three, facial problems. So in class three, where the mandible is prognathic, is forward in position, it's often associated with an anterior crossbite. So the lower teeth are in front of the top teeth. And this is often associated with a deficient maxilla. And I, like I said before, the maxilla fuses to the skull base around the age of 10. So we do need to see these patients young if we want to have any chance of developing the upper jaw and actually bringing it forward. So this is a little video of, of how we tackle these kinds of cases. We use an expander similar to one that I showed you prior, except this one, the difference is this one has hooks on the outside. And with these hooks, once the expansion has been completed, we can use this appliance, which is called a face mask, which don't worry, the kids only use at home when they go to sleep, doesn't leave the house. Uh, and what it does is once the maxilla is expanded and loosened, we can actually bring the upper jaw forwards over time. And we can correct the anterior crossbite and we can correct the deficiency in the, in the upper maxilla, in the maxilla, sorry. So here's a girl, 10 years of age, in class three malocclusion, the mixed dentition, maxillary hyperplastic width and in the AP, anterior posterior. So she's deficient in width and in length with a concave profile. And we treated her with expansion, protraction, which is the face mask and then braces. So here's the young lady. You can see prognathic mandible, concave profile, reverse overjet, class three molars, uh, all the whole signs of a class three. This is her at the end of treatment. So how did we get there? We had an expander plate to help develop the upper arch. Then the hooks on the outside with the face mask. And she wears that. The patients normally wear the face. The whole treatment for this is normally 12 to 18 months. So we spend the first two to three months getting the arch width right, the rest of the time getting the upper jaw forward with the elastics. Her second phase was with braces. And then we finish like that initial 
and final. And the reverse overjet and then the overjet corrected at the end. Buckley, you can see the reverse overjet on the left hand side and then the correction on the right and then the overjet here again, right and left. All right, so I think that's growth. So we're going to start to look at orthodontic systems. So how do we do all of this stuff? We've got braces. I've already shown you some of the plates, but we're going to look at some of the other appliances now. So we've got um, braces. I personally prefer self-ligating braces, which means each one of the brackets has its own individual door. And that's because they're a lot more hygienic. There's less friction, which means treatment is more linear and more efficient. And also you can get a lot more arch development. And you, because the old brackets never had doors, you had to use the modules on the brackets, which were less hygienic and with more friction, uh, which caused all kinds of issues for the patient and also for the practice. So self-ligating brackets for, for me in my, in my case, my practice. This is an example of the metal uh, braces, uh, initial and in the midway through treatment. And then obviously these braces also come in a ceramic version, the white clear ones, which is really good. These ceramic braces have come a long way. They don't stain anymore like the old generation did. And we also get really nice results with them too. So this is pre and, and mid treatment. Clear aligners, obviously taking over the world, as everybody knows. Um, Invisalign, uh, one of the big players, there are now lots of other competitors. But essentially, it's a series of clear plastic aligners. Each one moves the teeth along to the next stage. You get a clean check and you plan all your treatment digitally and you provide the patients with the aligners. And each aligner is worn for a period of seven to 14 days based on what you're trying to achieve. Invisalign has come a long way. It's been in the market more than 20 years now. And it started off with very simple, small, simple, straightforward cases. And now we're doing a lot more complicated things, uh, you know, like this patient over here with these really severe retronathic uh, incisors, uh, retrocline incisors and deep bite. He didn't want, when we met him and diagnosed him as a class two, div two case with a setback lower jaw, I said to him, if we straighten your teeth, you're gonna have a big overjet. And the only way to resolve that because you're an adult is either to take out teeth or to do jaw surgery. He didn't want to do either of those. He said, I don't care about having an offset. I just want to have straight teeth. So we said, okay, no problem. So we got in there, we straightened his teeth and that's the before and the after. You can see he's still in class two, but he's got nice straight teeth. And we've obviously created overjet here in this case where you can see initial to final, but he was very happy. And we had some deep bite correction as well, which was a bonus. So that's one case. I'll show you another one a little bit later on. Um, for completeness, I've included a couple of slides here about uh, lingual orthodontics, which essentially is braces on the inside, the palatal surfaces and lingual surfaces of the teeth. One such system is incognito, which is 100% customizable. Uh, the braces are placed um, usually in a jig. Uh, this is an old patient of mine uh, more than 10 years ago because I don't use uh, lingual braces anymore uh, because Invisalign has become so good but it still works very, very well. Uh, it's just a very time consuming um, system. And also there can be some more issues with the patients along with hygiene and discomfort. And Invisalign is, is so good now that I am, can manage all my uh, lingual cases with Invisalign. So that's, that's why I work in my practices. Skeletal anchorage, some of you may or may not have heard about. Essentially uh, temporary anchorage devices or TADs are used as a anchorage device and they prevent the risk of unwanted movement. So when we're trying to move teeth uh, that are very crowded or in a direction that would result in side effects somewhere else, we can use TADs or mini plates. And this patient here was an adult who came to me with a lot of overjet and she wanted to reduce it. So I said to her, okay, well, if we're going to extract in this case, I'm gonna to need to use TADs. And when I extract with my Invisalign cases, I pretty much all the time use TADs because it's so hard to control space closure. And so this is her on the left at the bottom, initial and final. She had maybe a seven millimeter correction in her overjet, which is you know quite significant. And, and uh, she was very happy with that. And we were able to do, to do that with Invisalign and with these TADs, which you can see a place between the 
one six and the one seven uh, in the maxilla, both on the right and the left hand side. So orthognathic jaw surgery, um, I put in here for completeness again, but essentially jaw surgery is used when the orthodontics concerns or the facial aesthetics are so severe that we can't resolve the issues with orthodontics alone, essentially. Uh, in these cases, surgery is used to align the jaws in, com in combination with orthodontics to align the teeth. Uh, risk, cost, morbidity, all those things have to be um, considered when doing jaw surgery. And there are lots of different jaw surgeries you can do. For the mandible, we can advance, we can set back, we can rotate. For the maxilla, we can do the same, we can advance, we can set back, we can expand, and we can also impact the maxilla for your very gummy smile patients or any combination of, of, of those, depending on what the patient needs. This is one of my patients who had a setback lower jaw and her jaw was asymmetric and she really didn't like her chin. So on the left side, you can see her chin is quite offset to the right, but she also had a narrow maxilla and she didn't want to do surgery in the upper. She just wanted to do surgery in the upper. So we were limited in the advancement and the rotation by the width of her upper jaw, which is why you see that her midlines were not completely corrected and that the chin is still slightly offset, but much better than what it was. And, and she was happy. She was happy with that too. So it's always a combination of what the patient wants and, and what we're going to be able to achieve when it comes to jaw surgery. And then lastly, stability and retention. Most important part of, about orthodontics because the worst thing, the last thing you want to do is treat a patient and then have to do retreatment. And unfortunately, things move our entire life, not just our teeth, everything in our body changes and the teeth are in the same predicament. What happens is that the teeth naturally drift forward throughout our life, measly, uh, and there are changes in the arch width. The arch width gets um, bigger and the arch length gets smaller. So these changes in the arches is gonna to lead to changes in the teeth, obviously, with or without orthodontics. So you can be an ortho patient or a non-ortho patient, you're still gonna have these changes, which is why teeth move. Um, this study, groundbreaking study by Little, um, was done over 35 years with 600 patient records. It's like a huge number. And they was all, all ortho patients and they discovered that of all the ortho cases, there were less than 30% of the cases were, were stable um, at, the, at the end when they did their assessment. So essentially that means that, sorry, 30% were stable, meaning 70% were unstable. So retention is a very important part of the treatment because the majority of patients' teeth are going to move and we need to find a way to stabilize those teeth. So, and then the lastly, just to say about Paquette in his article is that there's no difference between extraction cases and non-extraction cases. The teeth are gonna move both ways. So in my practices, my retention protocol um, are fixed retainers. We use a zigzag version of that so that patients can floss. Um, it's much better than previous straight wire uh, our internal bonded retainers. In the upper arch, I do it from canine to canine if I can. Uh, if the bite allows, otherwise it's two to two. And in the lower, it's usually three to three. And on top of that, I will provide a thermoplastic retainer uh, in one arch only so that there's no bite changes. And usually I do that in the upper arch because the lower arch is a little bit more stable because of the dense mandibular bone. Um, I think that's about it from me. Um, I'm happy to um, cover any questions, thoughts or comments that have arisen. Or if you want me to go back to any slides, please let me know and, and we can do that. But thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Ben. That was great. Let me bring this out. Um, I'm just going to remove your PowerPoint from the stream, but we can bring it back on if anyone wants to see um, any of the, the slides or you want to um, go back to anything. I do have a few questions from the, the audience, which, which I'll ask. Um, so you touched on the maxillary expansion appliances um, you use and what age your, your preference is with using them. Um, but someone wants to know what your thoughts are on using them after the, that mid 
Palatine Suture has has closed. Um, so in uh, older, it's an excellent question. Yeah, it's an excellent. It's an or, or adults. Are we just flaring out molars um, if we're using them, or can you reopen? It's so basically sixteen. Obviously, is the average of you know of the patients. If there is going to be differences, you know, within the population. We, I will stretch the envelope a little bit, um, but as you pass the age of 16, I will really start to slow down the rate of expansion. So instead of it being one turn a day, it might be one or two turns a week, and I might see the patient more regularly and just keep an eye on things and see how things are going. You obviously need to be, you need to monitor the buccal surfaces and the gingiva to make sure that you're not causing recession uh, as you're going and just doing it really slowly. I, I wouldn't push past the age of mid twenties. Like you could really go for it into the into the early twenties to mid twenties, but slow, just really slow. See what you're doing. At some point, you might get a bit of tipping, and if that occurs, well, then you just you're just going to have to stop. But you can push past the age of sixteen. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got another question from <laughs> from someone you know actually i'll tell you who that is after the the stream but they're they're asking about You're setting me up <laughs> i'm setting you up yeah i'm not <laughs> i'm not sure about this question but they're, they're asking about pseudo class threes and um possibly yeah. where, whether you treat them differently to a, an actual true class three yeah totally it's a, it's a really good question uh thanks for thanks for asking so for those who don't know, a pseudo class three is a patient who isn't a traditional, you know, class three. They actually, they're biting edge to edge. And then because that's not a comfortable position, they'll shift into a class three. So they'll, they'll start like this and then they'll shift into a class three, which is why we call it pseudo. Uh, with those patients, you don't necessarily need to do the whole treatment in the maxilla. Often it's because their maxillary incisors are either straight or, or retroclined or their low incisors are proclined. So in those cases, you can do some minor alignment of the anterior teeth, either procline the uppers, retrocline the lowers, and then you'll be able to resolve that shift. So yeah, there, there are other options. Uh, and in those cases, sorry, my Siri is going off. And in those cases... I, I, I won't. Often I can, you can use a plate or you can use some partial braces and you can reverse things pretty quick too. You know, I, it doesn't take much longer than six to 12 months to resolve those kinds of cases. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Um, I, as general dentists, we, we sometimes um, have patients come in where they, they've had orthodontics done 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and they, they were given fixed lingual retainers um, and sometimes they debond or, or they fracture. Is there, is there anything we have to be careful of um, when replacing them? Is there, is there anything you would warn against? Yeah, look, the most important thing when you're doing the retainers is that they're passive. So when you place them, they cannot be any active. So when you're gluing it to the tooth, if you have to force that wire towards the tooth, that wire is going to bounce back and it's going to move the tooth. So the wire has to be passive. It's the most important thing. One. Two, when you're doing the glue, you don't want overhangs. If there's any overhangs in the composite resin, like any filling, you're going to cause plaque adhesion, gingival inflammation, failure. So those are the two things that are really important. Um, making sure that the wire is well um, um, adapted to the tooth, passive, and then no overhangs with your composite resin. And make sure that when you're doing that, you floss just to make sure that you don't have any um, composite in the contact in the contact points. That's probably the most important thing you need to know. And you said that your preference with lingual retainers now is the zigzag retainers or the, the V-shaped ones. Is that because then the, the patient can still floss through and... Correct, the patients can floss, yeah. except unfortunately in your perio patients, you don't use the zigzag zigzag uh, IBRs because often the gingiva is lower than what the zigzag can actually be. So in most cases, I'm using a straight uh, wire and then they're using pixters or super floss to floss the, the interdental spaces under there so they can manage it that way. But for everybody else, um, zigzag wires. Okay. 
Um, speaking of Perio, that brings us to our next audience question where Alex wants to know um, your experience doing orthodontics on adults with generalized bone loss or perio and um you know wh whether there's any limitations on, on these cases what what kind of pathology do, do you consider do you have a preference of ortho options so um for, for those cases you you might prefer fixed over invisalign or you you might prefer you know re removable like like invisalign because the hygiene might might be better and easier um yeah, do you have, yeah do you have... it's 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 a very good question um i'll deal with the first part first which is with perio patients you just have to be slow slower than normal you don't want to accelerate the tooth movement they've already lost a lot of bone the, the teeth are going to move quickly anyway you just want light force and you just want to take it really slowly uh patients have had have severe perio more and they've lost more than two thirds the root the length root um of the tooth i won't treat them so if i'm looking at one third of bone support of the root I, I i won't do it um if it's mild to moderate cases then i'm happy to get involved and i always warn the patients if it's really severe sometimes you know you've got localized perio and it's one or two teeth that are really affected and the rest is moderate so i i just warn the patients i say look i'm happy to try this but there's a good chance we're going to lose the tooth. If you're willing to accept that risk, then I'm happy to do it. If not, I'll just leave that tooth alone and we'll do the rest. And you just let the patient decide. Your know, informed consent will, will guide you in those, in those situations. In terms of the second part of the question regarding which system to use, yes, um, aligners would be more hygienic. But the issue with aligners is, is that they're very retentive and you have to pull them out in and out all the time. And that isn't necessarily the best for perio patients, especially our more severe perio patients, where the teeth do get quite mobile during orthodontic treatment. I didn't cover that in the lecture, but when you do orthodontic treatment, if you imagine a tooth is sitting in a socket, that socket really expands and the bone around the teeth widens. So the teeth become really mobile. And if they've got less bone support, they're gonna be even more mobile. So uh, aligners, yes, you can use them. I would probably be, um, a little bit sparing on your attachments use a lot less attachments so that they're less retentive um but i've used yes even saying that i've used aligners with perio patients and braces too um hygiene is a thing but it also would depend on the patient as well so uh, some patients just won't wear aligners from a compliance perspective they think they prefer to wear braces and other patients won't wear braces because of the aesthetic issues so if the perio is mild to moderate, you could probably use the liners. If it's severe, I'd, I'd be careful. In a patient where, um, which I see quite often, that they might have a, a few low anteriors with, with some buccal recession um, and other orthodontic issues, and that they, they want orthodontics. Do do you? you know is assuming you're working towards the the final result you want do do you find that if you intrude those low anteriors or bring them more move them more lingually that some of that buckle recession can can resolve um or you can improve upon that yeah it's a great question uh so often when you have recession especially in the low anteriors it's because the the roots of the teeth have been pushed through the alveolar bone so if we're able to bring the roots of the teeth into the more neutral area of the alveolus so into the middle of the alveolar bone you can actually get bone reforming and then the gum reforming so the bone the, the gum goes with the bone if you don't have bone you don't have gum and unfortunately in perio patients a little bit of a misconception is that oh great we've got a big pocket perio is clear why don't i just intrude this tooth and then I'll get my gum back. But unfortunately it doesn't work that way because when you intrude the tooth, the bone the, and the tooth goes down, the gum will go with the bone. So you might get a little bit of improvement, but you're not gonna get all your gum back if you intrude a periodontally affected tooth. But with your teeth that have recession at the front, you can definitely improve um, the gingival um, recession to a degree. I mean, if you've lost eight, nine millimeters, and you're looking at the apex of the tooth, you're never going to get that all back. But 
you might be able to get you know a third or half of it back if you bring the root back into the alveolar process. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, we, we've got a, I don't know, you're popular, Ben. I don't know if we've ever had this many questions come through on a, a webinar. So right. there's a few more if you, if you have time. Keep shooting. Keep happy, shooting. Happy so the, this one, I, I'm not sure if you have any input, but someone's asked about your opinion on the COIS ortho course in the, the US. Any? Haven't heard of it. <laughs> haven't heard of it. Perfect. Sorry. Oh, I haven't heard of it. Um, so, of course. No, I haven't heard of it. No. Are oh, they so, thinking you're going to the US? <laughs> I'm not sure that. I'm not sure. Okay. But we've got another question. Um, this one coming from Caitlin asking if you could share your journey to specializing. And it sounds like she is trying to get into the program. So if you have any tips on how to get accepted into the program or to, to get on the, the pathway like, like you obviously were able to. <laughs> so what was the, what was the, um, person's the name? so I, I believe this, um, general dentist would like to do the same as you and okay. specialize in orthodontics. Um, sure, sure. No, I just missed, I missed I had a question. I just missed her name. Um, yeah, it, it was Caitlin. So Caitlin's wondering. Caitlin. Caitlin. Yeah, if you yeah. have any tips to to get into to orthodontics. So, Ka so Caitlin, Caitlin, essentially, it's bloody hard. And I I couldn't get in. Um, my first time, my second time, it's it's about it's about um, willpower, really. At the end of the day, uh, there are some things that you can do to help your CV. Yes, you you know you need the primaries and and and, and the secondaries. You know, if you can do those research, you know, they often like, you know, people that have done some research and published teaching. I did a bit of teaching, um, which helped too. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, it's it's tr trial and error. Um, it's such a tight program. They keep it so, the, the number of applicants so small that each university only takes, you know, four, five pay people per year and there's only five or six unis in Australia to do it. So I went overseas um, to qualify, which was great. But when I came back, it was an absolute nightmare to get qualified. It took me a year to get qualified. I had to present 10 cases treated from beginning to end. I had to present my entire um, course, which has to be um, at least three years um, hands-on. Uh, you have to do a thesis, publish um, research, uh, you have to show your course outline, any articles you'd um, published, all the courses that you'd been to. You just try and give as much information as you can um, to get. That was to get qualified as, as a specialist in Australia. Um, it's it's a, it's a long road. It's a hard road, but I highly recommend it because once you're there, you know I'm, I'm very happy with my practice now. So you you will have to go through some some hardships and some some pain. Uh, to get there, but well worth it on the other side. So, Caitlin, I wish you all the best. <laughs> so, to, to sum up, it's bloody hard, <laughs> right? Bloody hard. I think you you mentioned to me um, with the the process of getting registered as an orthodontist here in Australia, do, doing the the degree overseas, it was basically as much work as the the degree itself was. Yeah, my my document that I submitted to the council was seven hundred pages. Yeah, there you go. That was insane. My, my thesis, my thesis was only a hundred pages, so it was like <laughs> seven times the length. Like it was, yeah. huge. and also it took. It was multiple. It's a council that only meets every three months. You have to make a submission, and then they submit back, and then you get that, and then you have to make another submission. And it just takes a long time, so you have to be patient. But the good thing is you can work, and I worked as a dentist during that time. So, you know, that was fine. I was able to earn an income and, and, and get qualified. And, and they told me that that was quick one year. I, was, I thought it <laughs> took forever, but they told me that was quick. For most people, it takes longer. So I was, <laughs> yeah, I was pretty happy with the I outcome. Well worth it in the end though, right? 100%. Um, all right. We've got a two-part question from Wilson who wants to ask about retention. So he's asking... Um, about why you might have a preference of 
fixed appliance or a fixed zigzag retainer, whatever it is, um, lingual retainer over removable? Is it just because of compliance or is there, there other reasons? Um, and then the, the second part of the question is if the patient doesn't want the wire um, and you're, you're just doing a removable retainer, whether you have a specific protocol that you recommend for that? It's a very appropriate question, isn't it, Emmanuel? <laughs> it's a great question. <laughs> no comment. And I'm wearing that so, retainer. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you are. So, <laughs> so, so look, basically you hit the nail on the head. The, the, the main issue is compliance. I don't trust my patients. Most of them are kids. I, I finished their treatment. The adult, the parents have paid a fortune. I know that 70% of cases are going to relapse. So why would I trust them and give them a removal retainer? Just can't. I can barely trust them to wear their elastics, let alone to wear this retainer for the rest of their lives. So the fact is, is that the, the fixed retainers now are so, they're so flat, they're so flush that, and hygiene is so good that there isn't really any reason not to, not to use one. Um, it prevents two things, relapse, but also it prevents the patient coming back to my practice and, and saying, look, my teeth have moved and now I need to have a retreatment. And that is never a comfortable conversation because at the end of the day, someone's going to have to pay for it. It's either going to be the patient who pays for it the second time, or it's going to be you who pays for it because you have to redo that treatment for free. Neither is good. Nobody makes friends from retreatment. So you want fixed retainers. And I tell the patient, this is the gold standard. Fixed retainer in the bottom. I try and get a fixed retainer in the top and then a removal Essex. If they're not going to, if they, and if a patient fights me on it, I tell them, you know what? We're going to do this. If you don't like it, I will remove the fixed retainer, but give it a chance. Give it a shot. Try it for a week, a month. I've, I've only had maybe one or two patients that have come back and said, I don't like it. I need you to take it out. Because they just they think it's going to be worse than what it is. So we put it in. Most of them don't have, never come back. And you know what? You've got your patient retained. And you don't have to worry about it. On the flip side, if you have a patient that's really resilient, refuses, no, 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 I'm not going to take a fixed retainer. Well, what can you do? You have to give them removable Essex retainers. Um, and you need to cover all the teeth, seven to seven, uh, and you'll need to do top and bottom. I don't like patients wearing, I mean, removable retainers indefinitely together because the retainers are much thicker than what the aligners are, your Invisalign aligners. They're much thicker, they're much stronger. They can cause posterior open bites. And that's a really hard thing to correct. So if I'm giving them two retainers, I'm often asking them to wear one in the day and one at night. Not ideal, but it's their choice because they chose to not go down the fixed retainer route. So in those cases, most patients will wear the lower in the day, it's less visible, and they'll wear the upper at night time, you know, when they go to sleep. Or they can try wear them together, but if the bone opens up at the back, well, they know why and, and that's on them. But as a gold rule, golden standard, fixed retainers, upper and lower, removable upper retainer, and that's it. Hope that yeah, helps. I, I definitely agree with you, Ben. And I mean, as you know, I, I'm doing not anything complex, but pretty straightforward clear aligner cases, a everything complex. I, I refer to orthodontists like Ben, um, but of the, the simple cases I'm doing, I, I would say 75% uh, patients who, you know, have already been through ortho and either for whatever reason that they, they didn't have a fixed retainer. And I mean, no one's going to wear a removable retainer for, forever. And then thing, things relapse right. and they're, they're paying twice so they're, they're paying again and i mean for most people it's not the most fun process during treatment um so yeah i i definitely agree with you um we've got another question asking about limitations of of clear aligners so you touched on a couple things um with like space closure where really to get around that you, you would need to use TADS. Um, and I'm sure that there's other indications where if, if they want clear aligners, you, you would have to use TADS. Um, you, you also touched on the, the perio one where if it's kind of moderate perio, maybe you don't want something so retentive that they're, they're taking in and out. 
Is there, are there any other specific cases where your preference would be fixed? Yeah, so patients that have small teeth, really difficult to treat with aligners. Obviously aligners re require surface area um, and attachments. And if the teeth are small, so microdontia, or if the gingiva is, if they have hyperplastic gingiva, really thick biotypes, and you have a very small tooth surface, it's really hard to treat patients with aligners. First of all, patients that are heavy bruxes and grinders, they're also very hard to treat with the liners. One, because they've ground down a lot of the tooth structure and B, because they're gonna grind through their aligners. Uh, and thirdly, patients that have really severe crowding, particularly in the lower arch. So lower canines with a massive root, really hard to rotate. So, and, and often, sometimes you'll see, I, I call them when the lower incisors are, are flared and fan-like, you know, where the roots are bunched up, but the crowns are all kind of going in this opposite direction, but the roots are really bunched. Those are really hard to treat as well because the lower incisors are the smallest tooth in the mouth, hence less surface area. And when they're very crowded combined with a rotated canine, I mean, I've tried thousands of different ways to manage it. And I, I often will start with the liners with the, with the with the warning of the patient that we may need to finish with fixed. And um, I'll do my best to get most of it done. And if I can, great. And if I can't, I might have to use six fixed appliances for a period of six to eight months at the end of treatment. Um, off the top of my head, impacted teeth. I don't, I'm not really, there are some people that treat impacted teeth with aligners. I'm, I'm not there yet, um, but I think they're, do, they're doing it with TADS as well. I think that's about, that's about it, really. Yeah, I, I've definitely found, like you said, that in, in some of these cases with aligners, especially if I'm rotating, whether it was small teeth, whether it's upper laterals or, or lower anteriors, the, those are the, the stubborn ones where we, we got to order, you know, revision aligners um, and keep yeah. working on them a, a bit longer. Because, yeah, when small teeth, small round teeth, is is yeah. tricky and, and, and every, yeah the, and the more you do it the more refinements you do the more it costs your practice and the less profitable you're going to be so you want to spot those cases early and either warn the patient or charge more yeah because it's going to be harder and it's going to be more work for you and it's going to take a lot more time it's good advice ben we we got through all the questions Great, fantastic! Well, I was happy to happy to help. I hope everybody found it um, beneficial, and uh, it was my pleasure. Thanks for thanks for inviting me, Emmanuel. Brilliant! Thank you so much for for coming on. I, I know I'm really grateful, um, and I'm sure everyone in the the audience definitely took something away. Um, if anyone wants to know more about Ben or the wants the details of his his practice um, practices or, or anything like that please message me. Um, I'm always available and I, I'm on all the general dental residency Facebook groups. Um, so, so you can find me there and I can pass you on his details. Um, a quick little bit of kind of self-promotion for, for GDR. If you're in Sydney, we are also running a in-person um, course August 6th, which is a, a Sunday. So it's just going to be a, a morning um, we've got two amazing speakers, which is uh, Dr. Chidim Kapel and Dr. Ben Lee. So Chidim Kapel, she's the um, principal dentist at Dental Boutique Sydney um, and just a, a fantastic all around general dentist um, who, who does, you know, basically full scope. Um, Dr. Ben Lee owns um, as the founder of Sydney Prosthodontic Group in North Sydney um and again is a, a fantastic prosthodontist so they're, they're speaking about larger cases interdisciplinary cases um full mouth rehab type treatments and the the price we're, we're offering for, for this course which is going to be a, a catered um course course where we, we've got a whole brunch layout it's going to be great um there'll be certainly a lot of networking opportunities i think we've got something like eight tickets left so we, we, we've sold 55 tickets something like that um or a little bit more even and so there, there's not many left and at the price we're offering for kind of this 
full mouth rehab course, um, which is starting from, I believe, $154 for GDR alumni and new graduates, and then $250 for, for everyone else. I mean, you just, you, you couldn't get another course like that at, at that price. So if you're in Sydney or know any dentists who, who are in Sydney who, who want to come out, come along August 6th. We certainly got a few tickets left. So please reach out if you if you want any more details about that. Um, again, Ben, thank you so much. And I'm going to end the, the live here. Pleasure. Thanks again. All the best, everyone.